Hello, and welcome to Amherst Reads, an online book club that connects alumni, students, faculty members, parents, and friends to the intellectual life of Amherst College. Each month, a new book by an Amherst author is featured, providing excerpts, exclusive audio interviews, reviews, and more. My name is Matt McGann. I'm the Dean of Admission and Financial Aid at Amherst College. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Ron Lieber, the Your Money columnist for the New York Times, and more importantly, Amherst College Class of 1993 to discuss his new book, The Price You Pay for College. Ron Lieber, welcome to Amherst Reads. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for this conversation. Your book is honestly terrific. Um, it's the kind of response I wish I could write every time I get an email from an old friend uh, asking about college planning for their kids. They're like, you must know stuff. Um, that the kind of conversational tone, but with such deep practical insights is great. It's really clear to me that you put a tremendous amount of research into this book. You're citing obscure historical works, think tank reports, economic research papers, podcasts all over the place. And so what we've got here is a really excellent practical advice on one of the most anxiety inducing processes for many families. Uh, we're recording this conversation at the moment when students in the high school class of 2021, the pandemic class, are receiving their admission decisions and making their college choices. What are some of the things about the college choice for the college class of 2025 that have changed since the class of 1993 made your decisions? Oh, gosh. Well, I... I I think, I mean, let, let's talk about what's happening in the moment, right? Um, I, I think the um, ways in which the residential undergraduate experience has been compromised by the pandemic, hopefully only temporarily, and hopefully only through the fall of 2021, at which point, you know, all of the 18 year olds will have their jabs by, by Christmas. Um, I, I think it's brought a sort of renewed focus um, to value. Because the thing that happened in March, right? So I was supposed to finish this book in March of 2020. Um, and I had more or less pressed save. And we were about to go through the, you know, sort of copy edits and fact checking when everybody was sent home that second week in March. And we sort of looked at each other, nobody having any idea what was about to happen. And we thought, it doesn't really make sense to go forward with this, given how little we know about what's about to happen here. And clearly, there's been at least a large temporary disruption. And so we should really take a step back from this manuscript and just watch for a couple of months and see what happens. And it became clear that it was going to be longer than a couple of months. So I was just watching without any sense, just like you, of what was going to happen, how behavior was going to change. But I had come into that moment with a thesis, right? And the thesis was that um, most families don't think hard enough about what it is that they are buying when they buy a residential undergraduate education. I'd spent years asking them what they thought they were buying. Often they looked at me quizzically, but eventually they answered. And there were really three things that they were looking at. They were buying an education, right? The opportunity to have their minds grown and their minds blown, um, to have an expert practitioner, someone committed to teaching and being in the classroom, not one of these professors at large universities that despises teenagers, but somebody who actually loves teaching, um, you know, having them kind of take their brain apart and rebuild it uh, into a bigger, better version of itself. So people are going to school for the education. They're going for the kinship, right? For the friends, the peers they never could have imagined existing in the world. And also the professors and administrators who, who can become mentors over time. And then they're going for the credential. And maybe it's a credential that establishes them in the middle class or the upper middle class um, in, in a stable way that perhaps they hadn't experienced before growing up. Or they're looking for the kind of credential Credential that can open doors into rooms and experiences that they and their family never could have gotten otherwise. So sort of gold-plated credential. So when everybody was sent home in March, it became clear that the education, through no particular fault of the universities, who you know, were not prepared for this, the education became substandard. 
right? This was not a seventy-five or eighty thousand dollar education that people were getting in the spring, um, and the kinship was blown to smithereens. Right? Your friends are gone. Your professors are on Zoom. There's no more office hours. You know, you can't get invited to their house for dinner. The only thing that was left was the credential, and so it wasn't any surprise to me that a whole bunch of people, parents, fought for for refunds, sued for them even. Um, so there was a clarity that's come out of this experience that I actually think is not a bad thing. And I hope going forward um, that people, particularly as both the list prices and the net prices kind of grow to the sky, right? Much beyond where they were even on an inflation adjusted basis um, than they were a generation ago. I hope people will keep thinking about what it is they're shopping for and how to define value. And if there's ever any silver lining to this horror show of an experience we've had, um, I hope that's it. Yeah, and so you're originally gonna come out March, 2020 and then the pandemic hits. Um, I want to talk about content, but like I'm really curious about what it's like to launch a book during a global pandemic. Um, you know, I've, I've seen you doing book signings out on the side of the street, and um, you know, you obviously can't go out and do the kind of book tours that uh, I imagine you've done for your previous books. And how has that changed? How has it been different? What's been great about it, and what's been weird and not so great? Um, thank you for noticing. So much has been different. Uh, I was recognized from a podcast while sitting on the street in front of my local independent bookstore, you know, signing a big stack of books. You know, I've been trying to help keep the indies in business and channeling a lot of my, you know, a, a purchases through events through this, you know, bookstore in, in my neighborhood who, who has been a part of my professional life for a long time now. And so, you know, every week or so, I've got to go this afternoon, actually. Um, every week or so, I go over and I sign a bunch of books and they're not letting anybody into the store. So, you know, rain, snow, sleet, whatever, I, they put a little desk on the sidewalk for me and we bring a box of books out and I sit there at the desk and, right, and people stop by and they look at it and somebody was like, I heard you on the New York Times Book Review podcast. And I was like, that's great. Do you want to buy a book? <laughs> Um, so, you know, I'm, uh, books um, are not a mass market business. A lot of people, you know, see big publishing or they see, you know, bestseller lists and they think that, um, you know, tens and tens and tens of thousands of books are being sold, you know, by authors like me each week. The fact of the matter is, is that it only takes a handful of thousand of books uh, to make the New York Times bestseller list in week one. Um, so, you know, it's achievable even in a pandemic. So basically what happened was I was done in March 2020, thought it was going to come out in August in time for the, you know, the new season. We decided to wait. We figured certainly by August 2020, we'll know what's happened and how things are going to shake out. Um, instead, August 2020 came around and it was like the Wild West with, you know, a lot of these schools, not, not Amherst, but um, many state institutions and some larger privates, um, uh, you know, opening in an utterly reckless way from a public health standard without really being honest or forthright about the fact that it was about the money, right? Um, and they were basically crossing their fingers saying, um, we think we can avoid killing any undergraduates or any faculty. Um, if we don't have everybody come back, we'll be in such a precarious economic situation that we'll have to cut departments and fire tenured faculty. And then this won't be the school that you thought that you got into, right? We, we weren't having that honest conversation. The schools were just pretending everything was okay. Having people come back, 500, 1,000, 1,500 undergraduates get sick and you just cross your fingers that it doesn't spread in the community. Um, and so, you know, we were not talking about it in that way, but that's what I was observing. And, it, you know, the only thing that was helpful for me there was just an understanding, right, or, or an observation that the residential component of the undergraduate education system in America is something that people want so much, they crave it, right? It has become such a rite of passage, almost an entitlement, you know, for teenagers in the middle class and above, that not even a pandemic will stop not just the teenagers, but presumably their more sober minded parents from lining their kids up and like pushing them into a, you know, coronavirus cluster, uh, you know, of a, of a closed undergraduate campus bubble. And, you know, the totally predictable thing happened, which a whole bunch of people got sick. So what does that tell us? I think that tells us 
that you're pretty safe in your job and that Amherst is pretty safe as an institution because you know, for all of the, dis the disruption that has gone on in other industries, um, not very much has actually changed about residential undergraduate education as it's delivered and experienced. And that's because people really, really like it. So much so that they're willing to show up in a pandemic and cross their fingers. And that I thought was, was fascinating. So, you know, I was able to observe that. But yeah, then, then I had to put the book out in a pandemic. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that, um, the process wasn't all that different, right? I, I did a bunch of media interviews, did a bunch of podcasts, would have done that anyway. The events that would have happened in person happened on Zoom. That just allowed me to do more of them because I didn't have to get on airplanes to go do them. It allowed more people to come. In general, um, you know, if I would do an event, maybe 200 people would come and 50 people would buy a book. Um, and when I was doing events online, sometimes 500 or 1,000 people would come and maybe 15 people would buy a book. So people are showing up, not clear they're paying attention, definitely not pushing the buy button, um, but it did allow me to reach more people, at least in theory. One other uh, question I have about the book and the process of publishing it. Uh, so you, you and I, I think, first met at a professional admission conference in a <laughs> big ballroom or something, and uh, it was great to, to meet you in person. Uh, and I think at that time, I think the book had a different title. Was it mm -hmm. What to Pay for College? And now, obviously, it's The Price You Pay for College, which is clever uh, in a few ways. Uh, can you talk about how does a title come to a book? Is this, how did the title change? Who came up with the new uh, and more provocative title? Is that a process between you and your editors? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to hear more about that. Sure. So thank you for being polite about the way that we met, because what actually happened for those of you listening is that I essentially accosted Matt. It was his like second week on the job. And I came up to him and said, hey, I'm Ron Lieber, class of 93. You know, I write for the New York Times. I'm working on this book. And I believe with all my heart that Biddy Martin wants to get rid of legacy admissions. And I'm willing to bet that you're going to do it in the first year or two. And I'd like to talk to you about that. And <laughs> Matt was very nice in sort of not quite brushing me off, but letting me know that he wasn't quite ready to have that conversation. I'm not going to ask him about it here. Um, uh, so, uh, but thank you for asking about the title and thank you for remembering that. It was indeed called What to Pay for College for the Longest Time because when the light bulb first went off in my head, um, you know, four or five years ago, that this topic needed to be a book. I, I'd been collecting all this college and money stuff, knowing that it added up to something, but I hadn't cracked the code. And it was readers of the New York Times and also some classmates who were getting in touch each spring, increasingly agitated about this question of value in particular. And what I realized was that for all of the ink that I had spilled in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times over how to save for college and how to pay for college and you know how not to pay for college and how not to take on too much student loan debt, um, I had missed the most important question of all. Uh, people were coming to me and saying, okay, you know, my, my kid's into UMass Honors and they're into Mount Holyoke with you know, $25,000 a year in merit aid. So that's only gonna be $200,000. And then Amherst wants you know, $300,000 plus because we don't qualify for any need-based aid. So where's the big data set that tells me you know, how Amherst is $100,000 better than Mount Holyoke and $200,000 better than UMass Honors? And I was like, I, I don't have that data set, right? And I thought, you idiot, you've, spill, you've spent all of this time on those first two questions, but you missed the most important question of all, which is what to pay for college, right? It was a value question and a values question. And so I thought, all right, that's it, right? That's what I'm going to call this thing. And so I was calling it that for years. And then the publisher decided they didn't like it. They thought it was boring. They thought it was bland. They couldn't quite articulate what the problem was. Um, but they sort of charged me with fixing it. And they didn't have any better ideas. Um, so there was a, a moment, a week or two, where I wanted to be cheeky. And I wanted to call the book, This Could Cost a Lot of Money. <laughs> um, I thought that would be a way to kind of grab people by the throat. But of course, it doesn't speak college. And then at some point later on, uh, you know, as I continue to struggle with this, um, I was listening to Bruce Springsteen and, you know, he has a, 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 a I mean, well known to me, at least uh, a sort of um, a slower tempo song called The Price You Pay. And, you know, I'm singing along and singing along. And then all of a sudden, again, another light bulb. I was like, oh, 
this is it, right? The price you pay for college. And I sent an email off to, you know, everybody on the team and everybody was ecstatic and we did not ask Bruce Springsteen's permission. And so far there has been no cease and desist. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so let, let's talk content. All right. I, I, um, you, you mentioned uh, just a moment ago merit aid, and I am going to use the scare quotes. Of it, <laughs> say, merit aid. Um, and I, I think for a lot of uh, readers uh, at, that I, I've talked to, that was really one of the big revelations uh, of your book is how this merit aid system works, where it comes from. Um, and it, really, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a, an enticement to to students. Um, and at, you know, we were talking also about the these professional admission conferences, one of which uh, where you and I met, and they're often sponsored by those same companies that are doing the the deep data analysis, uh, the the money ball of uh, of these merit aid awards. Were you able to talk to some of the people behind those algorithms at some of those big companies that are producing the Merit Aid Awards? What were you able to learn about what is actually happening in the guts at these places that unlike Amherst are using these kinds of Merit Aid enticements? How does it work? How are they doing it at, at these uh, somewhat secretive companies? Yeah, believe it or not, they let me come to some of their conferences. They throw these annual conferences for all their customers. And I figured, you know, you don't get anything in life that you don't ask for. So I said, can I come? And they said, sure. So, you know, that's how I found myself in Orlando several years ago, uh, you know, when it was 104 degrees and 112% humidity in July, which is, you know, when the, the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the value seeking organizations hold their Florida conferences also when everybody in the industry is free to go, you know, not during the school year. So where to start with this? Um, you know, I guess for people who are not familiar with the concept of merit aid or why the scare quotes ought to go around it, um, think about it this way. Rank every residential undergraduate institution in America in rough order of selectivity or use the US news list and you know, combine them all into one list of prestige, more scare quotes. Um, and um, then remember that as much as you feel like you're a supplicant in this process, particularly at Amherst, uh, <laughs> um, remember that this is in fact a marketplace, right? Um, and uh, you know, for the vast majority of institutions, it's a real struggle to make their number, right? To get enough heads in beds. Um, and what's happened in the marketplace without anybody, um, you know, sort of talking about it squarely is that below about number 50 on this master list that we've made for ourselves, people's ability to pay full price, uh, if and when they have it, right, is increasingly not matching their willingness to pay. So there is a value question in the marketplace where people are asking, okay, you know, private institutions or out of state publics in particular, right, at a 50 or 60 or $80,000 annual ask, is it worth it? And there's only a certain number of families who, who have that means or, or the willingness to borrow, right? And so below number 50 or so, um, institutions are increasingly realizing that they can't command full price. They want to maintain the list price for prestige purposes and, and other psychological reasons we can skip for now. But below that, um, they've decided that they need to start throwing money at teenagers and their families to get them to cut. It's a discount, but they refer to it as merit aid because it slots, let's call it, you know, 50 to 80 or 50 to 100. In fact, it's only a reasonably small group of the students. And these are the students who do not have any demonstrated financial need, right? The old fashioned need based aid that I got back in the day from Amherst. Um, they're, um, there's only a reasonably small fraction of those families who are being offered this merit aid, right? And so if you've got really great grades and above average test scores, uh, you know, for, for the institution that you're applying to, um, you'll get an offer of $15,000 off annually or $20,000 or $22,000. And that's what's known as merit aid. So because this started in earnest, you know, almost uh, uh, 30 years ago now, um, 
it started all the way at the bottom of the list and it's kind of moved up and up and up and up. And so if you're down at slot like 332 down there, um, those schools, the ones around you that you compete with, they're basically offering discounts to everybody. Some of them have in fact reset their tuition 10 or $15,000 lower, but basically everybody's getting a pony down there because they've realized that Merit Aid has a, a psychological advantage, right? You know, you pat the teenager on the head, you pat the parents on the head for having raised a meritorious child and it makes people feel good about themselves. It's marketing, it's a coupon. Um, and when people hear about it this way, you know, they're sort of aghast that this is going on and sometimes outraged. But I don't believe that we should expect the higher education industry to behave any differently than any other industry. It's no sin to use pricing as leverage. Um, I don't have a problem with that. Um, I do have a problem with being people being ignorant of it. Um, which is why I wrote the book, right? Um, you know, an educated consumer is our best customer and I want all of my readers to be above average. So you mentioned these people that host the, these conferences, right? So it turns out that these um, admissions offices and one basic fact that people don't understand is that need-based aid comes from the financial aid office and merit aid comes from the admissions office, right? So the admissions office is outsourcing a lot, sometimes all of this analysis on, on, on merit aid um, qualification to these consulting firms that are working in the background that come in with these algorithms for rent and they suck in not just all of the data on you know, your student, but also on you as the parents. They use your zip code to kind of code for affluence even if you haven't applied for need-based aid. So they make some very educated guesses about how affluent you are. Um, they have graded your high school they're watching over your kid's shoulder as your kid interacts with, um, you know, with the college's website. Um, they look at, you know, 10 years of data from other people from your high school and other people with statistics like your kid. And the algorithm suggests a discount, right? So the algorithm basically tells the admissions office what to offer you to try and get you to come. And it's, it's much better at predicting your behavior than any human being could be. Um, so, you know, if you go and appeal your award, if you go back and ask for more money, the admissions officer you're talking to may have never seen the merit aid offer before because it was software, not a human um, who made that offer. So that's, you know, a, a feels long, but is actually a very short version of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and, you know, there's more nuance to it that, that kind of remains secret. Um, but, you know, it's, it's so profoundly confusing that a large handful of for-profit entities have sprung up to try to help families do the same thing that I'm trying to do with the book, which is figure out what the hell is going on here and how to attempt to, you know, predict and, and, and navigate and, and, you know, potentially get a, a, a better offer than everybody else. Yeah, this is probably the point where I should say to the viewers that Amherst has not wavered from its commitment to need-based aid and meeting full financial need. And that's been the core of what we've done here at Amherst for, for many years. But there are a lot of places, including a lot of places, a lot like Amherst that are really terrific that do this. One of the places you check, name check is Oberlin, which I love. And I think Oberlin is terrific. And they're among the many, many places. I mean, I think maybe it might be the rare place that doesn't employ merit aid. And it is a little bit uh, uh, mysterious, I think, to families. And, um, and I think it, it's, uh, it's frustrating to families and it was frustrating to you. You talk about going into, you talk to a lot of presidents, you talk to a lot of my counterparts who oversee admission and financial aid and enrollment. And you said sometimes when you're talking to them uh, and asking them about how this works, you get a little bit frustrated. And I'm wondering if you can think back to one of these companies. You don't need to name names, but well, what was a point where you were talking to someone and you did find yourself getting a little bit frustrated with the conversation you were having with university officials about this? Sure. I, I, I don't mind naming names at all because, um, you know, we, we sort of agreed to disagree. And um, uh, uh I mean, let me put it this way, right? I, yeah, I mean, let's just name all the names, right? The schools that I was most frustrated with are the schools where um, the officials there flat out refused to speak with me. Um, and that would be Oberlin, which refused to grant me an interview um, despite years of requests, and Connecticut College. Um, so Connecticut College is an you're trying not to, are you trying not to smirk Matt about Connecticut College? How how much how much do you how much do you hear from your coaches about the frustration of having to compete for athletes with Connecticut College and Trinity, given that they offer merit aid and you 
don't. I mean, does that ever come up in conversation? Is Connecticut College, you know, buying athletes away from Amherst? So uh, as you talk about in the book, and as you know, you can't give money to Division Three athletes for being athletes. But of course, you can do merit aid for all kinds of <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I like to redirect those conversations to remind folks of all the great things about Amherst that are pretty unique to Amherst and the uh -huh. unique position that we have that most places can't point to. So that's that's usually my uh, my approach on that. Yeah. So I was frustrated with schools like Connecticut College and Oberlin that wouldn't speak to me about this. Um, I think Connecticut College is ashamed, frankly. It's a, it, they're, they're not ashamed. They're embarrassed that their market position has eroded to the point where they had to start doing this three or four years ago. And it's not to their strategic advantage to talk about it. Um, it's, uh, um, you know, they're, they're, there's also, you know, an, an equity question involved here, which, you know, we don't have to get into, but um, there is some question as to whether, um, so merit aid has nothing to do with financial need. And there's a lot of really rich kids who are getting merit aid, right? And so there's an open question as to whether um, you know, th those discounts uh, uh, you need it more or whether if you, um, you know, get a whole bunch of rich kids who, you know, could pay 75 but won't and you get them to pay 55 and you have a large number of those, do they cross subsidize even more kids who can't afford to pay anything at all? Right, then would otherwise happen if no kids were coming at 55. So you can debate that one till the cows come home. Um, I would say the other frustrating thing, um, and the thing that remains frustrating for me, is um, the lack of predictability for merit aid awards. This idea that we should make what I believe is, you know, the biggest financial decision that families will ever make, without having a sense, even within six figures, like even within a $100,000 swing of what this will cost for four years, I think that's outrageous. Um, it's not outrageous on the need-based side, because with need-based aid, we have these net price calculators that give you a reasonable sense of what you might pay if you get in. But that doesn't exist for the most part with merit aid. So I remember being in the office of um, the guy who runs the, um, who, the guy who has your job at Case Western. And, you know, he's a very data-driven person, extremely experienced and well thought of in the industry. His wife is a college counselor. He's going, he was going through the process with his own kid at the time. And I, I remember, um, I think at one point I actually like banged my, my hand on his desk, you know, I was getting so agitated. I'm like, you have a better grasp of numbers, arguably, than, you know, anybody else in this business. How can you not provide this? And he sort of threw up his hands. He said, Ron, he said, algorithms are a really great way of predicting what would have happened last year. He said, but how can I put a merit aid predictability engine into the marketplace? He says, it's not like we don't have the firepower here to do that, but how can I um, do that with a straight face when I don't know in October how the new honor storm at Ohio State is going to affect my yield, the number of people saying yes in March. He said, my algorithm can't account for Oberlin making uneconomic offers or Carnegie Mellon making a decision to you know, double the amount of merit aid it's offering without throwing up a flare to me, which of course it won't do because I'm a competitor, right? Yeah. Um, and I and so so you know my retort to that was well that's fine I said but would it kill you to at least present some easily digestible data on in in statistics on you know who got merit aid and why and how from last year with a really large disclaimer saying like no guarantee it'll work that way this year and he sort of shrugged his shoulders and I think he thinks because families can go dig that out of something called the um, common data set. Um, that, you know, he's done his job on transparency. And I don't believe he has. Um, and I don't believe that any of these schools have. And I think it's outrageous, frankly, um, that they're asking people to, you know, commit to a group of eight or 10 schools that they'll apply to, particularly when some high schools um, won't let you, won't support you applying to more than eight or 10 schools as if money was, you know, not no object or whatever. Um, uh, and so, you know, I, I think the industry owes us more. And I'll bet you are so glad that you are above it all. Uh, not in a negative way, but, you know, in, in terms of selectivity, right, and, and prestige, you're not in a position in the marketplace where you have to address these questions. And that must be a huge relief. Because, you know, I remember looking into the eyes um, of the president of Carlton 
which you know is often you know ranked in the top five when people rank these things for small liberal arts colleges. And I sensed fear in his eyes when I asked him if he was a couple of years away from having to resort to merit aid because every other small liberal arts college in uh, in Minnesota and, and the Midwest, you know, including Grinnell, uh, you know, has to do this now. And not everybody wants to go live in the wilds of Minnesota, you know, more than an hour from the Twin Cities uh, and be indoors or, you know, wear boots or whatever for six months out of the year. And, you know, I sensed fear, um, you know, as an alum of Amherst, I'm glad that Amherst is probably not going to be in that spot for a while, if ever. But, uh, but you know, it's a rough market out there. Yeah, and I, I am grateful to be at Amherst and to be able to do financial aid the way we do. And that actually leads me, I, I wanna talk to you a little bit about uh, a character in your book who may be well known to many of our viewers today. Can you tell us a little bit about who St. Joe is? St. Joe. So um, uh, when I talk about St. Joe, I refer to uh, Joe Paul Case, who to my mind is you know the legendary, uh, kind of emeritus uh, dean of financial aid uh, at Amherst. Um, you know, he did the job for uh, over 25 years, I think. Um, and uh, so we didn't, when, uh, uh, when I was applying um, to Amherst, um, I, I, I was going to need about, you know, I, I, I was going to need about like half of a full ride, right? Um, and we knew enough <clears throat> to find help locally in Chicago um to you know get like a detailed explanation of how the need-based aid system worked um the guy that we hired to help us i don't think we had a sort of come to jesus conversation with him about the real risk of applying early decision i remember talking about it with my parents who were divorced and you know there was some contentiousness around both ability to pay and willingness to pay and there was no net price calculator and so we did not have a great sense of what would actually be asked of us. And yet I, I applied early decision anyway. So we took that risk. And the offer we got was, you know, like a solid B plus A minus in terms of our affordability. And but every year my mom flew out, you know, with money that we didn't exactly have, right, during parents weekend, basically betting that the, you know, $500 cost of the trip would pay off in an extra $1,000 um, from whoever it was that we were speaking to. And it turns out that the first time she came out, uh, we met with Joe Paul Case. And I learned at that time or not that long after that he's got a side hustle as an ordained minister. Um, and, you know, and he actually has that kind of priestly bearing. And, um, you know, he was he's just one of these people who is both um, a, you know, a technocrat, right, with an encyclopedic knowledge of the system and how it works, um, but also just like a fatherly, humane um, bearing. And every time, each of the four years we went in to talk to him, um, we came out with more money than it cost my mother to fly out to have the conversation. And eventually he kind of grew used to us showing up kind of hat in hand <laughs> asking for more. Um, and I don't remember feeling embarrassed or sheepish about it, which, which I think is a credit to him because that was before this notion of negotiating, which financial aid officers hate, right? They, they think of this, you know, as an appeal, as a conversation, right? Nobody wants to be treated like a used car salesman. But that was before I think a lot of people were doing that. Um, but I don't ever remember feeling badly about it. And he never made us feel badly about it. And, um, you know, I, I would have struggled a lot more had it not been for St. Joe, which is why he's known as such in our family. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and we're trying to keep that uh, going today. Uh, when uh, Joe retired, uh, Gail Holt came on as our new uh, Dean of Financial Aid and carrying uh, the same values, the same mission forward, trying to have Amherst continue to be the kind of place that it, it was for you and has been for generations of, of Amherst students. Uh, thing about value here, uh, you talked about, you, this is a very personal book in some ways, which uh, uh, I think is really terrific. You put a lot of yourself uh, in it uh, and it makes it very relatable. You, you talk about the value that you got out of, out of Amherst. Um, you give a, a special love to your class uh, of 93. I, I think you, you say so much love uh, to mm -hmm. the class of 93 um, and that the class of 93 made it all worth it for you. As you look back to your years at Amherst and what has that meant to you 
uh, in the post Amherst years? Gosh, I mean, I don't even know where to start with that. Um, I guess, let me, let me put it this way, right? Um, I went to an amazing K to 12 school growing up. Um, those people were and are my family. And I had this sort of chip on my shoulder about going to college where, you know, nothing was gonna be, be able to, to replace that, um, that community for me. And I had just given myself over to the idea that college was gonna be about other things um, because there was no way I was going to um, be able to make lifelong friends like the ones that I had picked up in the 14 years previous to that. Um, and I was totally wrong about that. Um, you know, the friends I made at Amherst um, are, you know, are, are equals in, in, in every way to the people I grew up with. And, and in, in, in some ways, um, they surpass them in one important capacity. So um, I was out speaking several years ago uh, in La Jolla, California, and Tom Herman, the legendary Wall Street Journal uh, tax columnist, now retired, um, came to hear me speak. And he brought his roommate from Yale from, you know, 50 some years earlier. Um, and they came and they heard me talk. And I'd done a little riff at the end about some of the college research that I was working on. And Tom's roommate came up to me and he said, you know, he said, the thing about Yale was that I met people there I never could have imagined existing in the world. And I still get goosebumps thinking about it and thinking about how that made me feel the first time he said it, because it totally clicked in for me. And that was how Amherst was different from Francis Parker in Chicago, um, because Amherst has the ability to hoover up people from all over the globe and people of, you know, just a much wider variety of backgrounds than you would get in a relatively narrow slice of the, of the Chicagoland area, right? And so, um, as I was writing the diversity chapter and about, about why it's worth paying extra to, to be educated in a diverse environment, I was thinking about all of the people um, who I'm closest to um, or the people who I felt like taught me the most. There's some people who I'm not that close to who I, who I remember you know, having taught me the most in college and since them as, as I sort of followed them on social media, right? And you know, I think about the, the guy who's you know, he fled Algeria as refugees and his grandfather was shot in the back and killed on the way out and how they like went to Israel and Paris with nothing and like started car washes in Phoenix, Arizona. And now that guy's an Amherst trustee, right? I think about what I learned from him and his family. I think about my African-American roommate who um, had gone to, uh, a fancy boarding school, like unlike any that, you know, I could have imagined existing in the world and all the experiences that he told us about, you know, being in that environment and what it was like for him um, at Amherst and all the things I've learned from him since. I think about the Filipino American, um, you know, kid from the elite private, the elite public school in New York City. And um, I think about uh, um, uh, my friend, Jonathan, who was the first friend I had um, who was out and gay and what I learned from him. I think about, um, you know, the conservative who grew up in Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn and some of the experiences that um, one strange um, experience in particular that we shared uh, at Amherst and um, how much I learned from him, right? And, you know, none of these people, uh, you know, were, uh, you know, middle-class Jews from, from the Midwest, right? Um, and, and so I think more than anything, right? Just, it, it was that, it was that kinship. I mean, I learned a lot at Amherst. I probably could have you know, spent more time uh, on my on my studies, but I, I did learn a lot. Um, and the credential has absolutely been worth something to me, particularly in my first um, couple of years in journalism, where I was like hired and edited by a succession of people who went to Amherst. But it was that kinship that really has made all the difference for me. And that alone was what worth is what was worth paying for. And all of those people who impacted me the most um, uh, are people who were different from me in at least one and sometimes many fundamental ways. So that to me um, was what sort of was what was what made it what it was. I want to keep going, but uh, I'm getting the hook, the gong. Um, <laughs> we're coming up on, on time here. I, I do want to show the book again, just so that people 
uh, have it in their minds. This is not just for, uh, for people uh, who are going to college or who have children or grandchildren going to college. I think it's a really uh, fascinating look behind the scenes at what college is today and thinking about the place of higher education in American society. So I hope that uh, many of our viewers will, will pick it up uh, in independent bookstores. Um, and uh, it, it, it's great. And uh, you've got great stuff out uh, on your social media. So are, you're at Ron Lieber on, on Twitter and Instagram. Is that That's right? right. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely a good follow uh, and uh, you know, support journalism. Uh, I, I've been a print subscriber to the New York Times for I think 20 years <laughs> now. So uh, you can uh, read Ron's Your Money columns and uh, stimulus coverage and everything else uh, in the Times. Ron Liebert, thank you so much for being with us today. This was really terrific. Uh, I, I hope we'll run into each other again soon. Um, and I hope I don't get the Rick, Rick Bischoff uh, <laughs> slamming the, the fist on the table. Um, but I, I do look forward to uh, catching up again soon. Hopefully all of this will allow uh, us to be together in the same space again. I hope so. Thanks to you and thanks to everybody out in the Mammoth Nation um, who has been so generous uh, to me, not just in the last six or eight weeks since the book has come out, but, you know, throughout my career, um, you know, the entire Amherst community has just been so supportive at, at so many, uh, on so many levels, and I'm intensely grateful as ever. Excellent. Thank you again. And uh, yeah, the price to pay for college, Ron Lieber. Thank you very much. Okay.